Lisa the Hopeful has a giant issue right out the gate that risks making it a much worse experience than its parent official game, Lisa the Painful. You see, Brad transversed multiple biomes with dozens of different characters, ranging from a literal fish to a man dressed as a fish to rescue his daughter. It was not a short adventure, and over its runtime we saw multiple flashbacks painting an accurate picture of the tortured soul that is Brad Armstrong. With a runtime of roughly 20 plus hours, you'd be forgiven for thinking Lisa the Hopeful, a much smaller fan derivative work that only has a fraction of that time, around four hours, has the odds stacked against it. Yeah, Lisa the Joyful wasn't the longest either, but it had the benefit of building on a much larger story that came before it. After finishing Hopeful to its completion, I can soundly say that it really surprised me. Despite my gripes on both the gameplay and story fronts, I walked away from it with a profoundness that felt very fitting for the world of Olath. And even though I never empathized with main character Belt Boy's character, character arc or inner demons like I did with Brad's before him, it was still very much a solid fan game that's worthy of not just any Lisa fan's time, but anyone who enjoys good video game storytelling and really tough turn-based battles. Regardless of its shorter length, it still found the time to get me to care about its characters and unique slice of Lisa's world. Oh, and also I got to record my single favorite five second clip of any turn-based game, because seeing a football player literally attack a football to get its health down to zero is just an amazing sight. Lisa the Hopeful opens with four men coasting along Olath's barren lands. Based on the music and expression scene, it's immediately obvious that at least for now, the tone is decidedly less dreary than the absolute hardship that was the childhood of the main game's protagonist. If you watched Better Call Saul after binging Breaking Bad, you'll know all too well what it feels like to see a fictional world you've already visited through a different lens, and I really like the change of pace. Don't get it twisted though, even if things are more upbeat for now, the dynamic between these four characters isn't exactly sunshine and rainbows. They stick together to survive, sure, but there's a crassness to the way some of them speak to each other, so potent it's difficult to tell if it's tough love or just hate. A stern and peeved man named Rodriguez calls to attention the three main characters of our story, one steps forward named Cyclops or Clyde, a man donning football gear who's more interested in tackling his problems than talking them through. Through. Liam, or Lanx, a tall and dorky fellow who should count as lucky stars he survived this long, and the protagonist, Benny, or Belt Boy, whose cocky smile and outward appearance instills confidence in his allies and is an odd endearment in the bleak world of Olath. Their car has run out of fuel, and Rodriguez instructs the three of them to find gas in the area, as if that's something that's easy to do. It doesn't take much convincing, considering that's really their only option to proceed forward. The three do as they're told and investigate the area. We take control of Belt Boy for the first time, and I was pleased to see that similar to Joyful, we actually have a dash. So unlike early on in Lisa the Painful, we aren't dreaded to slowly walk everywhere until we get the bike. Trekking through some desert cliffs and caves, we end up in a green-tinged mountainscape that is peppered with the usual bandits and touch-starved men we've come to expect from Lisa's world. Combat is identical to that of Painful's. The party members fight like you think they would based on their appearance and personalities. Belt Boy's moves are flashy and all over the place. Lank's attack animations and damage are wimpy, so he leans into providing support, though later on you do get a respectable DPS move that allows you to attack all enemies at once called Fireball 3, and Cyclops, who uses an array of tackle attacks to overwhelm his enemies. After doing battle, the heroes find themselves near a campfire, and it's the first time we learn about a mechanic unique to this game. As you probably already know, Painful lets you rest at these to get all your health back, with the condition that something bad can happen in the night, like a party member getting stolen, a big debuff happening to everyone, or something else. Resting in a fire here won't do that. Rather, you'll choose one party member to stand watch while the others sleep, meaning the person who has to stay up won't get any health SP or TP back. Kinda neat. One of my favorite things about Painful was its ability to pressure the player with tough decisions by not being overly generous with currency or consumables. It gives a weight and meaning to item usage that many other RPGs just cannot match. And this tradition is not only carried over and hopeful, but exaggerated. Seriously, this game is tough. 
Jesus Christ, some of these battles pushed me to my limit. I had to constantly dish out damage when fighting large groups of enemies so I could immediately get some players off the field and have an actual chance at survival. You'll find yourself selling off obsolete gear the instant you get something new so you have just enough currency to get a revive, damaging item, or anything in between. Belt Boy and his friends ruminate by the campfire. They discuss what it's like to be with a woman. Timidly, Lanx explains that he's never been with one himself, while Cyclops stoically states that he did. Between the flicks of the campfire, Belt Boy concedes that there was a girl in his life, but points out rather vaguely that it's more complicated than it seems. The trio continues their journey the next day, but are unfortunately ambushed. Dazed and off-put, Belt Boy and crew wake up to a rather creepy sight. In a dark room, several men start crawling towards them. A battle commences. Fighting our way forward, we come across a man named Gordy Golden, whose pompous expression and complete disregard for the party members makes him immediately dislikable. He explains that he's fixing to ransom off Belt Boy and crew, but they aren't exactly thrilled with that idea, so they do battle and fortunately win. In Gordy's office, they actually do end up finding the gas they originally set out to obtain, so things are certainly looking up. At least they are until... The crew scrambles outside, and absolute chaos is sprawled across the ground and building. Red-soaked men are splattered up and down the pavement. Whatever caused this, it's angry. When the men find their way back to the starting point, they become surrounded and greeted with the awful sight of what used to be their boss, Rodriguez. The gang responsible for this tragedy does not belong to Rando, or any gang we've come to know in the official releases. This is a brand new faction known as the Lovelies, a collection of sinister meaning and smelling savages who are in a desperate search to find any woman to satisfy them, while also trying their damnedest to destroy any innocent life they pretend has wronged them along the way. Basically, a group of Across the Spider-Verse fans. Their uniforms are neat and give a unique visual identity to Hopeful's story. Belt Boy and crew are stuffed in the back of a truck and taken away to an unknown location. They arrive at their destination, which seems to be an outpost for the Lovelies, and one of them orders Belt Boy to come with him, alone. In this room, completely disarmed, Belt Boy quickly pieces together what this guy wants to do to him. Thankfully, being disarmed doesn't necessarily mean helpless, and you'll be able to use context-specific attack moves like struggle and bite to defend yourself. Belt Boy kills the would-be Discord moderator and makes a mad dash out of the truck into his friends to escape, which miraculously they manage to do, even though from what we've seen they're kind of surrounded, whatever I guess. They undo the bridge behind them to make sure they're in the clear, and fortunately there is a save point present. The landmass we're about to enter is the most unique I've seen across both this and the main game. Lisa the Painful bravely incorporated lots of action set pieces and timing challenges into its game gameplay to break up the turn-based battles, which was a wise move since things that are turn-based are especially prone to getting repetitive quick. This part of the game in particular subjects Belt Boy and friends to a swamp laden with some wonky mushrooms that not only dampen your stats, but completely flip the observable world, which makes the otherwise basic platforming a puzzle in and of itself. Finding respite in a cave, the crew finds yet another campfire to gather themselves. Lanx calls into question their motive and how morally sound it really is. It should be noted that at this point in the story, it's not exactly clear what the cast's goals are. Brad's story was very straightforward early on. Buddy was taken from him, and he had to go and get her back. But here, it's less cut and dry. Based on this conversation, it seems that, like most men in Olathe, they've heard there's a girl out there and won a piece. Lanx acknowledges that while the repopulation of the human race is important, what if this girl doesn't want to do the deed in the first place? Cyclops goes full Blizzard employee and tells Lanx it doesn't matter what she wants. The crew uneasily relaxes into the night. Belt Boy and company slowly steer awake and continue their journey through the swamp lands, but the visions have a firm grip on Belt Boy's mind, clouding his judgment. So much so that before him, there actually seems to be a girl. When fighting her, you don't do much damage on account of the mushroom debuff, but getting far enough in the battle reveals a terrifying truth. What you're fighting is actually a joy mutant. After that horrifying episode, you'll navigate the rest of the swamp area before coming across visions of the same girl, except 
except she doesn't refer to our protagonist as Belt Boy, but by his actual name. Walls encase us from all sides, and the swampy reeds and chirping wildlife disappear, giving way to tiles and soap-stained floors of a fast food place. We're in the past. We get to see the dynamic between our three main characters before the Flash, and it's not drastically different. They're all working at Wally's. Lanks and Cyclops give Belt Boy a hard time for not sealing the deal on a childhood friend of his, the same girl we saw in the swamp area earlier, as a matter of fact. Rodriguez enters the room and yells at them for talking instead of working, confirming that all four of these characters knew each other before the Flash. As Rodriguez lectures the three of them, his head disappears from his shoulders, replaced by a dark red stain. Interacting with him calls into question Benny's motive. Is he really just like most men in Olathe, trying to find a woman just to satisfy some selfish urge to compensate for the lack of closure with his childhood friend? Or is there a deeper sophistication and maturity to Benny that we've yet to see? Benny wakes up next to his party members. They'd passed out in the swamp and very fortunately were saved by some nearby folks. Convenient. The folks in question seem to be a giant frat boy guild of sorts. It's taking me all sorts of willpower to not throw as many blizzard jokes into this video as possible. Like any new town in an RPG, feel free to soak up each avenue of this place talking to different NPCs to see what they have to sell you. You'll also come across a pretty cool action set piece where you have to avoid barrels to progress. Entering this room, we get to talk to the head honcho of these frat boys, and while conversing, you accidentally let it slip that there's a woman on the loose, which sends the entire room into goblin mode, forcing a battle. This encounter is not easy. I had to carefully choose one to use my precious few perfumes and heal items to actually make it out the other end of this fight. With their leader defeated, our party awkwardly takes their lead because I guess anytime they're surrounded on all sides by an enemy faction, they're able to just leave without consequence. The gang takes a truck and coasts through Olathe's countryside, counting their lucky stars they've managed to survive each faction they've come across. In the present, things are calm, giving our heroes time to reflect. Yet as we all know, an idle mind, especially in the world of Lisa, is the devil's playground, and it isn't long before Benny's past turmoils bubble to the surface. A crash disrupts our journey, causing the trio to search the nearby area. We come across a most interesting structure, the one, the only, sports dome. The events that transpire in said sports dome have a lot of hype surrounding them, not just because of the fact that it's basically a series of death matches with a football in the middle, but because the prize consists of a boss door subscriber's dream, a full-on woman. Now, there's a couple of problems with this claim. One, the last time we were promised a woman in a Lisa game, we got this, and two, Buddy, while platonically cute, is quite young. But I guess most people in this world take what they can get, so it is what it is. This part of the game really brought back fond memories of working my way up to fighting Rawcock in the Thousand Year Door, as you'll be fighting multiple enemy teams to advance forward, not unlike the wrestling sequence in Painful. As per usual, you'll have to carefully consider what items you buy and use, just do know that you can sometimes find consumables in defeated enemies' rooms. Oh, and also you can pay this guy to poison the enemy team before a match for a hundred bucks. Quite handy. Fast forward some battles, and during a night's rest, Benny finds himself sinking into to his past yet again. <laughs> Benny wakes up and brushes off his inner feelings to focus on the final battle in the tournament. Our heroes prevail, but things aren't looking up, because after becoming the champion of sports, we get the classic you weren't supposed to get this far speech from the sports king, who is frustrated with our progress and the loss of his men. He sicks his pet joy mutant on us, 
and a battle begins. Hopeful has some of the scariest Joy Mutant designs I've seen, and while this one is no slouch, it's nothing compared to what we'll eventually see. Winning this fight brings out the Sport King's inner cowardice. He pleads for his life and explains that the girl he was keeping as a prize has unfortunately escaped. Classic buddy, am I right? Our conversation is interrupted by our captors from earlier, the Lovelies, and they are not happy. Not everyone is walking away from this place with their lives. Beltboy wakes up. Standing over him is one of the tourney contestants who decided to nurse him to health on account of respecting his abilities in battle. Benny is injured but able to stand. Initially, he says he's giving up on his quest, but considering that Lanx is captured and completely helpless, he can't just quit now. With Lanx in trouble, Beltboy has a goal far more noble than what the crew originally sought out for. Across tattered bodies and blood-stained walls, Benny limps across the arena, determined to retrieve his friend. He gives Clyde one last glance before heading out, yet before he can get to the exit, Mm-hmm. <laughs> 